Hello and welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. Today we welcome award-winning journalist and author Jelani Cobb. First, we have something special. When forums were in person, we would always start with music. For this month's special series, we wanted to bring that back. We have a special musical performance from the Minnesota Opera to start today's program. It's presented by the Westminster Performing Arts Series, which engages the community with high quality performances that connect artists and audience collaboratively. This special musical opening is about 12 minutes long. If you're in a hurry to get to our talk with Jelani Cobb, you can skip ahead using the slider bar below. Otherwise, Please sit back and enjoy this special piece by the Minnesota Opera. The year is 1920. Will, a black soldier who fought in the Great War, is getting ready for the day as a civilian. A day that for a black person in America can be nearly as treacherous as being in enemy territory, when at any moment a battle could ensue. <laughs> Keep looking in on those memories Always scanning, but I'm not on the field I fought for this country Shed blood for this army Don't tread on me, goddamn, let's go a Harlem hell fighter never gets no quarter. Come back home to the same old story. A black soldier without a hero's glory. I rise for those who didn't make for those who survived it. Don't tread on me, goddamn, let's go. Works in the war and works right now. Don't tread on me, goddamn, let's go. Don't tread on me, goddamn, let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Don't tread on me, goddamn, let's go, let's go. Standing in line, that's not your turn, it's mine. Now you were standing behind, I was just following the sun. What you're playing, you don't know who you're messing with. Your eyes betraying the glee of joy and the pain you feel. Hiding behind the protection in the whiteness of your skin. Hey! I'm the black liberation, huh. my power lies within. Huh. 
You're pulling on a huh. trigger that you huh. can't pull back in the grenade. Huh. Fight or flight, huh. I must decide huh. if I can put a cage on this rage. A cage on this rage. You wanna tread on this rage? Don't tread on me, goddamn! If you wanna go, then let's go. What you're playing? You don't know who you're messing with. Your eyes betraying the glee of joy and the pain you yield. Ah, Excuse me, I was standing in line, it's not your turn, it's mine, and I was born in line, and you were standing on a cage on this page, don't tread on a cage on this page, don't tread on me. The year is 1970. Colette, a black woman, comes home from her first day at work after some white woman worked her last nerve. Hello, sugar, welcome home. Mrs. Manager, here you go. your first day as a manager. Ooh, it was so hard. Wanna talk about it? I don't know, no. I'm here. <laughs> I got your back, though. Was it like the time when the white man pretended your ideas was his and you promptly shut his behind down? <laughs> Respectfully, of course. Respectfully, that was a good <laughs> but one. But was it like the time when the white woman told you to get out of her way and mm. then rolled her eyes, and you rolled well, your eyes harder, and yeah. then she frowned, and okay. then you said, you and better not try, and then she put her hands in her purse, and then you... Let's go. <laughs> I walked in with my head held high. Sure did. You know I was looking fresh and fly. Sure was. Rode up the elevator, walked to the receptionist, smoother than gel on time. Wow. While the white lady behind the desk, mm -hmm. she slowly looked me up and down. Oh, no. Asked if I was here to clean the restroom. Hell no. It got me twisted, these manicured nails still make a fist. Yeah. If you want to put yourself on my work bass list, yeah. walk into my office and I'll teach you fast. Hmm. Might be the first, but I'm not the last. Hey. To climb up this ladder with my civil rights, if you act full, I'm gonna have to fight. Forget the suit and my three degrees. I'm a squisher like the bug that you're trying to be. Oh, wow. Well, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> but I asked for the owner instead. Hell yes. Said this was a business and I must be mistaken. She was tripping. Oh, racism. Hmm. So I chose a diplomatic route. Uh huh. When I want to flex my clout. Flex, clout. baby. Should have seen her face later when I was introduced as a manager. Business These manicure nails still make fists. If you want to put yourself on my with press list, walk hey. into my office and I'll teach you that. Might be the first, but I'm not, not the last. last. Instead, I said, change is coming soon. Change While watching her play like a rock balloon. Soon. You can either move forward or get left behind. But I won't tolerate your racist behind. <laughs> Come on, tell That's it. That's right. Tell it. I won't tolerate your racist behind. Nope. Uh -uh, look. But time and time to shine. Oh, I'm going to start a revolution in this corporation. Uh -huh. Hey. Yeah. Time. The time has. But the pain remains like a loop in my brain. Hey, one day I'll never have to code switch. But until then, I'm 
not gonna flinch. No, hey, we're gonna ride the south, cause it's our time. 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 Yeah, come on, gonna ride the south. It's our time, time, my time, my it's time, time, your time, your time, your time. time. Yeah. Hey, hey, damn right. Damn right. Right, right on. on. Damn Barbecue Becky calls 911 on a barbecue party, claims they don't have a permit, they claim to be in danger. June 2018, Permit Patty calls the cops on an eight-year-old selling water. October 2018, Key Fob Kelly physically blocks black men from entering lecture apartment building. May 2020, Central Park Karen calls the police on a black man bird watching in Central Park that pretends to be in danger. June 2020, Permit Karen calls police on a couple updating the house with a stone patio. This history. Sick and tired of people testing me. I see you stalking me. Can I help you? Best friend. I hear your degrading tone. Trigger happy on your cell phone. Power hungry, could cook Karen. Big a smile you're wearing. wearing. Why tears you shedding? shedding? Backtracking from your seats. 400 years we got receipts. Yeah, I'm recording on my cell phone. Now please just leave me alone. Stop your other policing. Ain't white savior casting. Pray for your safety, what about my rights? Would you do that if I was white? You didn't introduce yourself before claiming rule over someone else. Didn't even try to get to know me. Nah, you just want to control me. Stop. Go write in your journal. You're being awful. And I don't have time to coddle you or time to educate you. Period. August 2020. Nina walks into a store and gets followed around until she purchases her goods. She is waiting to get picked up and every five minutes someone stops to ask, Can I help you? Ask for her receipts to check her purchases. And by the third time, her blood is boiling. Don't tread on me, goddamn, let's go. 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 Ready for something new. Ready for something new. Hello, my name is Shonda Smith Baker, and I'm the Chief Impact Officer and Senior Vice President at the Minneapolis Foundation. The foundation is honored to partner with Westminster Town Hall Forum to present the special speaker series, The Arc Towards Justice, Taking Stock One Year After George Floyd's Death. 
Throughout the month of May, you will hear from some of the country's most leading voices in the pursuit of racial justice. They will help us reflect on where we are one year after George Floyd's death and where we need to go from here. We believe that every single person in our community has a role to play to ensure George Floyd is never forgotten and that his death leads to real change. We all have work to do, we have things to learn, and we all have ways that we need to grow. Each of the speakers in this series will offer wisdom and perspective that will help us on that path. On behalf of the Minneapolis Foundation and the Westminster Town Hall Forum, thank you for joining us today. Together, we will help build the arc of the moral universe towards justice. Greetings and welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Today, we're speaking with award-winning writer and journalist Jelani Cobb. For more than 40 years, the Town Hall Forum has invited speakers of conscience to address the issues of the day from an ethical perspective. This program is part of a special series called The Arc Toward Justice, taking stock one year after George Floyd's death. This month, we're presenting four talks by National Voices on Racial Justice. We're asking each person to reflect on where we are one year since George Floyd's murder and where they believe we should be going. You can also learn more about each of these talks on our website, westminsterforum.org. We would like to thank the Minneapolis Foundation for being our presenting sponsor for this series. We'd also like to thank the Polad Family Foundation for co-sponsoring production of these programs. We would like to take a moment to thank our media partners as well. Thanks to Minnesota Public Radio for recording and broadcasting all of our forum programs. Thanks to our longtime media sponsor, MinPost, a source for nonpartisan news coverage of Minnesota and beyond. Find more at minpost.com. And we would like to welcome a new media sponsor of the forum, Sahan Journal. Sahan Journal provides news coverage that illuminates issues affecting Minnesota immigrants, communities of color, and redefining what it means to be a Minnesotan. Learn more about and see their coverage at sahanjournal.com. Jelani Cobb is an award-winning writer for The New Yorker on issues of race, history, justice, and politics. In 2015, he won the Sidney Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis Journalism for his columns on race, the police, and injustice. In 2016, he teamed up with Frontline for the documentary Policing the Police, which examined the enormous complexities and realities of race and policing in America. That production earned Cobb the Walter Bernstein Award from the Writers Guild of America. In 2020, following the murder of George Floyd, he and Frontline produced and released an updated version of that program. Cobb is the author of several books, most recently, The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama, and The Paradox of Progress. He teaches at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Please help me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Jelani Cobb. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to be able to talk to you all today, you know, albeit a somber topic and you know something that really is at the center of our civic life right now. And uh, I couldn't think of a more crucial or more appropriate place uh, to be having that conversation uh, than within the community of the Twin Cities. Uh, you are more familiar than many right now uh, with what it feels like to be in the crucible of this broader question uh, surrounding policing, use of force, race, uh, and our criminal justice system, the intersection of all of those things. And so I just wanted to take a, a little while to kind of outline uh, some of my perspectives uh, on this question uh, before we jump into the, the Q&A and the broader conversation. Uh, I do two things. I'm a journalist and I'm a historian. At one point in my life as a young person, I thought those two uh, objectives were uh, contradictory. Uh, but now as a person who's a little bit older, I recognize the ways in which they are complementary. The historical part of me contextualizes the journalism that I do. And the journalistic part of me thinks about the ultimate implications of the history that I'm interested in. And when we were subjected, when the country saw the indelible images 
of George Floyd's last moments on May 25th of 2020, it felt as if there was a collision between the past and present, that in talking about George Floyd's fate, we were not talking about news, or at least not exclusively talking about news. We were talking about history. We were talking about sociology. We were talking about democracy. We were talking about the enduring paradox of race within the oldest constitutional democracy in the world. And all of that coming to the fore in the moment that we saw police officer, former police officer, Derek Chauvin place his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck and maintain that position we now know for nine minutes and 29 seconds until Mr. Floyd's life had been extinguished. We look at these questions or we tend to look at these questions anew, uh, almost generationally, although each that the uh, metabolism with which we have confronted these questions has sped up in recent years due to technology. But this is not a novel concern. In 1935, there was an incident in which a young man, a 15-year-old teenager, was beaten by several police officers uh, in a department store. He was accused of shoplifting, was beaten by several police officers. The rumor began that he was he had been beaten to death. That turned out to not be the case. As a matter of fact, New York City newspapers ran a picture of the young man uh, standing next to a police officer uh, the following day in an effort to stem the tide of violence that erupted upon word that a young man had died. But it wasn't simply a matter of misinformation run amok. It was the fact that this narrative had a certain credibility that police believed, or rather the community believed that it was possible for a police officer, to, for a police officer to have beaten a young man to death. And we saw an explosion, Harlem riot of 1935. Eight years later in Harlem, we saw uh, in an incident that James Baldwin uh, wrote about uh, having witnessed a, another explosion in the course of World War II, an off-duty soldier, a soldier who was home on leave, uh, was uh, beaten by an NYPD police officer and resulted in an explosion of violence, uh, rioting, looting, and so on. The same thing happened in Detroit that same year. And the police in a conflict between blacks and whites over access to a beach uh, and the police effectively weighed in on the side of white residents uh, brought to the attention of a young investigator, an attorney uh, by the name of Thurgood Marshall. If we looked forward, we'd see the same pattern, 1964, again in Harlem and Bed-Stuy, Bedford-Stuyvesant community in Brooklyn, 1965 in Watts as a result of an incident of police brutality, 1967 in Newark, 1967 in Detroit, several smaller instances in 1967. 1968, nationally, too many cities to name, including uh, Minneapolis, where there are the uprisings in response to Martin Luther King's death. And then we go to 1992, 1980 in Miami, uh, where a man by the name of Arthur McDuffie was beaten to death by Miami police, which resulted in five days of rioting. 1992, Los Angeles, with the famous Rodney King video, uh, that many of us saw and for the first time believed that we had a neutral arbiter of technology that would change the way in which these cases tended to be adjudicated or not adjudicated. And we saw all four officers acquitted. And the subsequent explosions, as a writer, as a young person, I began by covering the shooting death of Amadou Diallo uh, who was a immigrant, West African immigrant, uh, who was living in New York City, was shot 19 times by the NYPD in the vestibule of his apartment building. And uh, I was so stunned, and this was just a few blocks away from where I lived in the Bronx at the time. 
uh, that I was so stunned that I began writing about these issues and I've continued, unfortunately, to have many more cases since then to write about. Just in our recent years, we would have to talk about Philando Castile, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, uh, Rakia McBride, the uh, Jamar Clark in the Twin Cities area also, George Floyd, and the Alton Sterling. Just the, the litany has become uh, all those names that we see in George Floyd Square that have been uh, spray painted onto the asphalt and that long, we see how long that list is of people who died in these encounters with the police under circumstances in which they should not have died. One of the reasons why I think we have, a, we tend to have a redundancy here is that in 1935, a commission was convened. And it said that the problems that we saw that arose uh, with the Harlem riot uh, were not simply about the beating of a young man, uh, but they were a reflection of a broader systemic discrimination. And it was connected to matters like housing, employment, uh, educational opportunity, as we would just say, generally life chances. In 1965, we saw the same thing, uh, the uprisings in Watts, which generated a report. 1967 Newark uprisings generated a massive, and I've actually read these volumes, uh, something like a 10 volume report uh, that looks at the causes of what happened in Newark in 1967, uh, followed the following year by the Kerner Commission report, the famous federal governmental report, uh, which was ordered by President Lyndon B. Johnson to examine the causes of the multiple, the stream of uprisings that had characterized the previous uh, two years in American life. And only to realize that that report came out about a month before Martin Luther King was assassinated and there would be another spate of uprisings. Uh, and with the exception of Martin Luther King and his assassination, Every single one of these incidents, these large scale uprisings that we've seen in American cities has been in response to police violence. And nearly all of them have generated reports that said that the police violence was simply the spark that set off a powder keg, which was created by a broader systemic set of discriminations. This is what we saw with Rodney King after 1992. Uh, this is what we saw in Ferguson, which was a story that I covered uh, in 2014, and so on. So when we look at George Floyd and George Floyd's death, it's tempting to see the conviction of Derek Chauvin in high, under highly unusual circumstances, a moment in which the entire world was staring at America in the eye to see if we had the civic will to do what we all knew was justice. And under those highly atypical circumstances, a conviction was achieved, which does not usually happen in these cases, as you've likely seen. Statistically, the data is far more likely, indicates a, a far greater likelihood of officers being acquitted or not even indicted in circumstances like this, even in egregious abuses of police power. But really is naive to think that we could so simply resolve a problem that we've known has broader systemic roots. And so I'm not a native of Minneapolis. I'm not terribly familiar with the Twin Cities. But I did get a kind of crash course in the history of the communities there. And I think that it's striking to me the extent to which they paralleled so much of what I've seen in other communities. For one, the deaths of Philando Castile and Dante Wright in suburbs, which reminded me 
uh, of the death of many of the other individuals we're looking at, most notably Michael Brown uh, in Ferguson, which is a suburb of St. Louis. And the extent to which the presence of African-Americans in suburban communities has uh, ignited a kind of hyper reaction of police. And we tend to think of these as urban problems or urban concerns. But many of these cases, when we go through them, like John Crawford in Ohio, uh, when we go through them, we can list just how many of them did not happen in cities proper, but happened in suburban outliers or the, or the inner ring suburbs of communities. And it reminds us that one of the most frequent areas of conflict between African Americans and police were in the enforcement, was around the enforcement of segregation. That African Americans would likely have negative encounters with the police when they were in areas where they were prohibited from uh, being as a result of segregation laws. After the 1964 Civil Rights Act, we struck down those kinds of formal laws. But we still have an informal code that permeates the way that we interact, that determines the way that we see our communities react to the presence of African-Americans. We still see the bigger institutional questions that, that animate the question of police violence. I'm not unaware of that vast disparity between the life outcomes and the data on uh, employment and home ownership uh, and lifetime earnings and healthcare status and the vast disparity between black and white where the city, uh, the Twin Cities areas ranks as number one or close to the top for white people and nearly at the bottom for African-Americans. And so I'll caution this to, to wrap up, to conclude my comments by simply making one point, one that I'm sure, or reiterating a point that I'm sure that all of you are aware of and have begun to grapple with in your own way already, which is that if we want to ever be free of the constant tide of news stories regarding unarmed people, or people who are killed in routine interactions with the police, Black people who suffer this fate, we're going to have to do a lot more than address policing. We have to actually summon the will to push toward a systemic equality to supplant the systemic inequality whose most visible face has been in the murder of African Americans at the hands of officers of the law. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Jelani. I, and your, your perceptions of our community are accurate, and we're becoming increasingly aware of these over recent years. The disparities are real, uh, and you know, anyone who knows the history of this, of Minneapolis in particular, knows uh, the the discriminatory practices in real estate, especially. Mm -hmm. Uh, the um, housing covenants, the redlining, uh, when those covenants were outlawed as uh, ways to manage where people could live and not live. Can I, can I add something to that really quickly? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, my good friend, Yuhuru Williams, who's my college classmate and as a history professor at the University of St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a conversation with him and he talked about the housing covenants uh, and the deep roots, they go all the way back to 1909 in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And because as Americans, we tend to disparage history uh, or at least believe that we are free, large by and large, free of the grasp of history's implications. That you know, we're born into the world and we kind of make our own way. But one of the more notable things that I found is, you know, in, in writing about Freddie Gray, who was killed by the Baltimore police, mm -hmm. and in writing about uh, Michael Brown, who was killed by Officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, uh, and in writing about George Floyd and Dante Wright, St. Louis, Baltimore, and Minneapolis were all among the cities that most 
early, they were the, among the earliest cities to adopt residential housing covenants. Hmm. That the legacy of discriminatory housing was just, that was almost the, the kind of uh, groundbreaking uh, for the broader set of systemic inequalities that came in the wake of them. Uh, but, you know, Baltimore was one of the earliest cities to do that uh, with the residential uh, housing covenants. As a matter of fact, there's, so there's a Supreme Court case that the NAACP fought uh, that was connected to that. Uh, there was another Supreme Court case that was fought, Shelley versus Kramer, uh, regarding uh, discriminatory housing covenants uh, in St. Louis, in the St. Louis area. Uh, and uh, there's the the long history of housing covenants in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these things are not at all uh, kind of uh, happenstance or coincidence, coincidences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, when the Great Migration began from the South, uh, African-Americans were moving north, the northern cities began to enforce uh, these ways of segregating our population. and. Uh, you know, when we speak of a systemic racism, it's it's in the the, the very uh, real estate laws. Uh, it's in uh, educational systems, uh, and the police become. You know, how do you enforce? How do you enforce those systems? The, the well, the police become the kind of the leading edge. In, in your uh, experience of Minneapolis, you I, you were here, I think, some weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have a self perception, the self, you know, image of this is a progressive city, of, um, you know, the DFL, Democrat Farmer Labor Party, mm -hmm. kind of runs this place, and yet it's a city that where this happened. Uh, there's sort of a cognitive dissonance, I would say, in our own self-perception. What, as a, as a person coming from the outside, a journalist and historian, what did you see here in terms of our own the, the learning that, that is happening, uh, or maybe not happening yet, in our uh, uh, public officials, uh, in our systems here. Any mm -hmm. observations? Well, well, I'll tell you, there was a learning curve for me, um, because I was struck by that very contradiction. You know, I think that the Minnesota nice thing is true. <laughs> you know, I was struck by just how nice people are there. Uh, and you know, I jokingly said, I was uh, talking to uh, my editor about this, and I said, uh, oh my God, these are the nicest white people in America. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there is this other set of inequalities. And, and you know, I think that what kind of perplexed me for a moment was the fact that there are, you know, the resettlement of immigrant communities and a place, you know, I was aware of, you know, the, the sizable Somali uh, community there and uh, the Hmong population there. And, you know, even though I have not spent a great deal of time in the Twin Cities there, I have a lot of uh, close relationships uh, in the scholarly community there and talking uh, with uh, my good friend, Peter Ratcliffe, who runs the Eastside Freedom Library in uh, St. Paul. Uh, and, you know, having come there to, to do speaking engagements before and, and gotten a sense of the kind of multicultural uh, community that has evolved in the Twin Cities area. Uh, and at the same time, the, you know, the, the tolerance and, and significant numbers of people uh, who are in interracial relationships uh, in, in the community, all these things that are hallmarks of a very forward thinking, uh, accepting uh kind of almost idyllic kind of environment. And then at the same time, the statistical inequalities are as savage as they are anywhere else. And that was perplexing to me for a moment until I realized, until I remembered where I grew up. And you know, I'm from New York, about which we would say all of the same things, except for the nice part. Yeah, except for the <laughs> nice part. <laughs> you know, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of like nice once you get through the shell, you know. But aside from the nice part, you know, this is the, the most, I grew up in Queens, which is statistically uh, the most ethnically diverse county in the whole United States, the entire United States. Uh, and we have all sorts of uh, cultural and, you know, there's, food from every corner of the globe and in all the things that we celebrate about you know multicultural environments uh, and in in some instances a good degree of people interacting with people of different backgrounds 
But we also have the same sort of statistical reality that when we look at the numbers, they still comport uh, to the yield of a kind of systemic inequality. Uh, and so it reminded me of home in a very strange way, <laughs> that those contradictions were not unusual. I just had not anticipated encountering them in, in another place. Yeah, bit of a rude awakening for us, I think, in our community. Uh, Let's, let's talk about uh, what the Attorney General is doing with Minneapolis. Uh, you said you were just on the phone with him. Uh, patterns and practices, uh, mm -hmm. the, the DOJ investigation that's coming down, uh, which has been welcomed by our political leaders, by our police chief. Uh, what And you've, you've studied this, of course, extensively in your work um, in Newark and elsewhere. What can we expect with a DOJ, a Department of Justice investigation here of our of our police practices and patterns. Sure. Uh, so the, the DOJ investigations, um, you know, tend to come uh, about in two ways: either you know, kind of community driven, uh, or there are other kind of extenuating circumstances, large scale events that uh, bring the police department onto the radar of the, the Department of Justice. One of the things that came out of the 1994 crime bill, which is a kind of much reviled piece of legislation by people on the left, but one of its redeeming qualities has been uh, that it created this mechanism. You remember the 94 crime bill was written just two years after the Rodney King riots. And so it gave the Department of Justice the capacity to do oversight over police departments. Prior to that, there was none. There was no real federal authority. Uh, to give oversight or guidance or correction to problematic police departments. Uh, and so they're going to look at uh, certainly the community and the whether or not there's a, a pattern or practice, pattern of practice rather, uh, in which the kinds of abuses that culminated in the death of George Floyd, uh, whether or not those things were uh, an anomaly or if they were uh, commonplace, uh, enough for people to have said, this is fundamentally how this department operates. One of the other things that people tend not to know is that uh, in these pattern of practice, uh, pattern of practice, sorry, investigations, it's not uncommon for some of the biggest complaints to come from internally within the police departments themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, when you have broken police departments, they tend to also have broken internal affairs uh, mechanisms uh, so that the police themselves uh, can become victim of some of the same sorts of problems that uh, plague the, the police community relations. Uh, and so it's on those two tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I will say is just, just scratching the surface. Uh, and I was there two and a half weeks or so. Uh, just in talking with people and going out and interviewing people, there were a lot of instances, uh, and I'm not, I wasn't there to do that, uh, but there were a lot of people who had their own stories uh, of violence or mistreatment or at the very least uh, problematic interactions with the Minneapolis PD and the St. Paul PD. Uh, and so I expect that the DOJ will, will have a lot uh, of of material to go through. And they tend to be very thorough in these investigations anyway. This is the Westminster Town Hall Forum and I'm moderator Tim Hart Anderson. We're talking with writer Jelani Cobb as part of our special series, The Arc Toward Justice, taking stock one year after George Floyd's death. This program, like all town hall forums, is provided as a service to the community, completely free and open to all. That is thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Donations from individuals make up 85% of the forum's budget. If you are able, we encourage you to consider supporting the forum, which you can do on our website, westminsterforum.org. Thank you. And now with that housekeeping out of the way, let me pursue a little bit your comments about uh, our police department here. Uh, it's interesting, our police chief, I don't know if you had a chance to meet, uh, Chief Arredondo, uh, while you were here, uh, I do know him. We meet with him. The clerk, there's a group of clergy meets with him. We meet every two weeks. We've met with him during the trial just to kind of give him some perspective on things from uh, the street side. Uh, and uh, also, we could hear from his side uh, safety and security concerns. You, you know that he was among a group of black officers who sued the police department years ago uh, for racial discrimination. And now he's chief of that department. Uh, you know, of course, uh, our, of our union and uh, problems with the union. Uh, 
the, does it, uh, presumably the result of the investigation will be a consent decree? Is, that's where these usually go. Can you describe so, what a consent decree is? And can it touch a union, a police union? <laughs> well, that's actually kind of the, the comp where it gets complicated. Uh, if there is a pattern of practice determined and saying that this is, you know, how this department functions, uh, the result is usually a consent decree, which is an oversight agreement that the DOJ uh, comes up with, uh, the department signs on, and it is uh, overseen by a federal monitor uh, who is a person who's uh, chosen uh, by the feds uh, and agreed upon by the department. Uh, and so this person is essentially uh, a kind of operational director for the consent decree. Uh, you set benchmarks about what you want the department to do uh, and what kind of reforms you want to institute and that federal monitor is there for any number of years uh, until the department reaches those benchmarks. Uh, and so that's you know one part of it. The other part of it is that the union is another component and very often the union head has more power over what happens within a department than a police chief does. And so in the instances where the union signs on, uh, you see consent decrees move fairly smoothly. Uh, in instances where the union is hostile or antagonistic, even if the department itself in, in the person of the chief or the, the uh, leadership uh, of that uh, department uh, if they are in agreement, in agreement and the union is not, then you have a bumpy road ahead of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that becomes one of the potential twists in how things uh, are navigated once the consent decree is in place. Mm -hmm. Have you, You've seen these consent decrees uh, across the country in various cities with various police departments. Do you think they work? Do, is there substantive change? You know... Um, no two consent decrees are the same. You know, no two departments are the same. Uh, it's a mixed bag. You know, one thing is that you know, there are 18,000 police departments or so, around that number of police departments in the United States. Uh, the DOJ only at any given time has a handful of them uh, in consent decrees. Uh, and the, you know, manpower, woman power to... Uh, oversee a, a small number, a fraction of those departments. Uh, within that, there are some stories that are successful, some stories that are not. Uh, Newark, uh, you know, where the consent decree, the new mayor, well, then new mayor, uh, Raz Baraka, when he was elected in 2014, uh, had a nice uh, federal uh, intervention uh, in a gift box waiting for him as soon as he came into office. Uh, and so that was the first thing that that greeted him. Uh, and they celebrated this year the fact that they had not fired a single shot in 2020, but still uh, affected a resulting drop in crime. Uh, and it, they're you know intensely proud of that. And they have a, a federal consent decree that's overseen uh, by a person who has a real kind of insight into how police departments work. Uh, and so there's that. In other instances, you know, the departments, uh, a few of them in Ohio, you know, Cleveland being one of them, uh, where you don't see a whole lot of progress. Uh, interestingly enough, LA, which was uh, the reason that the entire consent decree program came about, uh, was initially one of the early success stories uh, that uh, they began taking different approaches to things and began innovating and uh, doing things that, uh, you know, the community responded positively to, like uh, deploying police in conjunction, in tandem with social workers uh, for calls that were not purely about law enforcement uh, and, you know, trying different things that seem to have had a positive effect. And so it really is almost, you know, not to make light of it, given the tragic circumstances, but it's, it's almost like a gym membership. Uh, that you mm -hmm. get as much out of it as you are willing to put into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who are on the ground here calling for defunding or abolishing the police are skeptical, frankly, about mm -hmm. a DOJ investigation uh, affecting sure. real, real change. 
Sure. Uh, uh, what's your sense of the knowing the context here? Uh, um, you don't know what the DOJ investigation is going to do, but do you think we're a context that might, in fact, be a place where a consent decree could make a difference? Yeah, it could potentially. You know, for one, you know, you have a chief who understands these things, um, you know, intuitively and personally, uh, and you know that's always a big benefit. Uh, and the other part of it is that the defund the arguments for defunding the police have an interesting kind of history that we've associated them now uh, with you know politically people on the left or people on the far left politically uh it is really not that radical an idea uh i was working you know his the kind of uh, unintentional plug, but uh, I have a new edited volume of the Kerner Commission report uh, coming out in this summer. And, you know, I've read significant portions of the report, but, you know, it's an 800 page report. I'd never sat down and read the report. And in combing through it, uh, I found uh, a kind of small section, and this is in 1967, 1968, where they wrote that uh, having police respond to non-law enforcement related issues generates an unnecessary amount of friction between police and the community, and that there needed to be alternate mechanisms, alternate, alternate uh, community and city institutions that were capable of addressing community concerns without involving people with firearms. And uh, effectively, they were saying that they needed to create these alternate structures, the same thing that people who were saying defund uh, have been saying. Uh, in Newark, uh, about $5 million from the police budget has been taken to uh, fund alternate violence prevention kinds of programs. Uh, and given that the majority of the police calls in most cities uh, are not for specific law enforcement related things, you have police doing all sorts of things like uh, traffic enforcement, et cetera, uh, it does make sense to say uh, perhaps there are better ways to make communities safe than uh, by only using uh, the kind of anvil and hammer approach of policing. Uh, that said, you know, as I or, or jokingly say, uh, because these were uh, in the street activists saying defund the police, there was an immediate uh, defensive posture that people threw up. Uh, however, if a a thousand dollar a day consultant uh, showed up in a fancy suit and did an extensive evaluation uh, and then did a PowerPoint and saying we would like police to function on their core capabilities and spin off uh, responsibilities to these other entities, uh, they would leave with a fat check and a round of applause. So uh, <laughs> I think that that idea probably suffered more from its political implications of the language. Um, and from the people who are making the argument than from the argument itself. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, police with firearms. Uh, last year, during the pandemic, 23 million firearms were purchased in America. The, it's a record. Uh, for, now there, there are 120.5 firearms per 100 residents in America. We're awash in weapons. Uh, what, what does that say about the kind of policing we need, apart from the racial dynamics? Uh, the, the, uh, you've ridden with the police. Is it a violent world out there? Do we need, uh, a, a, in effect, a militarized force to protect our, our cities, our citizens? So, I mean, one of the most interesting insights that I got from this uh, was during the... Uh, the trial of Dylan Roof was the young man who shot and killed nine people in Mother uh, Emanuel in the church shot, basement yeah. there yeah. in Mother Emanuel uh, Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and at the same time that trial was going on, the trial of the officer who uh, killed Walter Scott in North Charleston uh, was happening. And uh, those two trials were across the street from each other. And so I would bounce back and forth uh, between those two trials. And one day I saw the, the lawyer who was defending uh, the officer, and I forget his name right now, but the officer who shot Walter Scott, uh, but he was spending a lot of time in the Dylan Roof trial. And I just kind of you know, pulled him up and started talking to him. Uh, and you know, he told me he was close friends uh, with the, the mother of one of the victims in Emmanuel. 
Uh, and, you know, they've been close friends since childhood. He said the only way that he could prove she wasn't his biological sister was that she's black and he's white. Um, uh, but, you know, very close relationship. And so we get into the conversation about, about the nature of police violence in this country. And what he said was notable to me. He said, we have a kind of self-created problem that uh, because we generally have decided as a society uh, that we will not regulate firearms, that we have police who would reasonably can believe that any person they interact with might be carrying a firearm. And so because there is the presence of firearms, you have to have not only uh, police who are armed to the teeth, but who are hypervigilant about whether or not they face some sort of jeopardy. Now, overwhelmingly, they do not. Uh, and one of the things that I pointed out in my work was that in many communities, uh, just a random African-American man in his 20s has a higher likelihood of being killed than a police officer does in the course of his or her career. Uh, so it's literally more dangerous to be a black civilian than it is to be a police officer of any uh, background. And so we don't uh, have, we can't uh, address this question uh, of the amount of violence that police face or whether or not the, their vigilance is warranted without also addressing the question of whether or not the vigilance of the entire public is warranted. Because we have sold our public the idea that you have to have a firearm uh, you know, in the small of your back, uh, in your purse, in your ankle, uh, in a shoulder holster. And it, we kind of go out as if we're going to the OK Corral uh, as opposed to going to the supermarket. And having sold ourselves this idea of you know, the need to be perennially in a defensive posture, uh, we wind up with the kind of policing that echoes that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that those two problems are interconnected. I think they are, too. Within 24 hours of the verdict of, uh, in the murder trial of George Floyd, you know, six people were killed in encounters with police across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, police go into these encounters as they did with Dante Wright because of an uh, outstanding warrant on a gun-related uh, charge. They go in expecting to encounter a, an individual who's going to do violence against them, and they want to get get to the violence before the individual does. Right, which is which is a, a kind of weird idea, because uh, at the same time, you know, uh, if someone says, "Well, I think the argument, as we saw on the right, with people like he had a warrant on a gun-related charge," yeah. um, which I think was supposed to be an aspersion about his character. Like, but it's America. We have more, literally more guns than we have people. And so and on what basis do we ever say like, oh, okay, we're concerned about this person having a firearm. Um, there's a really kind of simple way of addressing that, which is that we need fewer firearms and, and more rigorous uh, kind of uh, standards for someone getting possession of one. Uh, but we won't go in that direction. And, and that's, that's all the kind of low hanging fruit before we get to the actual issues of race which I think are salient and immediate and central to all of this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, I'm sure, familiar with Isabella Wilkerson's book, Cast. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is the policing system a way of maintaining a, a caste system in America? And, and uh, will tinkering with police issues with, through consent decrees really make a difference? Isn't there something more profound needing, needed in America? Sure. I, I mean, I think that... When we looked at, if we looked at the 1990s, um, when we had the, the astounding uh, amounts of violence that characterized the society, and we've talked now about the, the miraculous decline in violence and crime uh, in the United States, and we're getting numbers that you know, we haven't seen since the 1960s and so on and so forth. That can mislead us into thinking that this is not a violent society. You know, it's that we have gone from uh, absurdly violent down to merely very violent. Uh, and you know that's an improvement, but that doesn't eradicate the problem in itself. And so I think that when we're looking at the kinds of reforms as it relates to policing, there are things that make a difference but they don't eradicate the problem. We can reduce the likelihood 
of a police officer killing an unarmed African American or killing someone in the circumstances that they should not be killed under. But we can't fully alleviate the problem without addressing the bigger systemic issue that uh, Isabel Wilkinson points to as caste. You know, there are maternal mortality disparities. There are employment disparities. There are educational disparities. There are home ownership disparities. There are, just walk through all of those categories in which there's a kind of racially based disparity in the, the quality of people's lives. And we'd be foolish to think that we will somehow or another have all of those problems, but we'll have pristine policing, you know, that somehow mm -hmm. policing can exist outside uh, the societal context in which it operates. Uh, and so, yeah, but, but I don't think that means that it's not useful. We have to start pulling at the tangled ball of yarn somewhere. Uh, it's just saying that ultimately we're going to have to address things far more extensively if we want to resolve this one problem. And, and do you think that uh, perhaps, especially because of what we all witnessed uh, in the murder of George Floyd, do you think white people are, are um, coming to terms with some of these realities in new ways? Is that your impression or is... Uh, I hope so. I mean, I think I, in some ways, um, having written about this subject for so long made me well equipped to write about what was happening with George Floyd. And in other instances, I think it gave me disadvantages. Uh, because in so many of these stories, I have seen the absurd be rationalized. And when I saw the video of George Floyd, I was horrified. As a matter of fact, I refused to watch it. Um, I just saw that kind of clip that was bouncing around. I refused to watch it, to traumatize myself by watching it for uh, weeks and weeks uh, before I actually sat down to watch the video. Uh, and... I thought, this is horrific, this is terrible, uh, but people are going to find some way to justify this. And I was shocked because almost always the people who are in the street are the same color as the person who died. And I think even early on when people were saying, do you think this is going to be different? I would say no. Uh, but I looked at the footage from Salt Lake City where there were those gigantic protests that were going night after night after night. And, you know, the other joke that I would tell is that I was in Salt Lake City for a talk and I met all the Black people while I was there, um, you know, because it was a very small <laughs> Black population. Uh, and uh, that population, you know, that wasn't Black people. Uh, there were outraged white people in the streets of Salt Lake City. Even more and lots of other, excuse me? Even Mormons were in the street. Even Mormons, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, people who were who were the kind of um, communities that would not directly be affected by this, mm -hmm. but across the country we saw that happening. And so I think that George Floyd's death may well have, res and, and because of the extraordinary length of time that that video runs, you know, uh, eight minutes and forty six seconds. And the incredible commitment that it took for Derek Chauvin to remain in that posture for as long as he did, all those things combined, I think, may have enlightened people to the fact that this is a country where something like that could happen, which is something I think many, many, many Black people knew before, mm -hmm. um, but many people in other communities did not necessarily know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. Of course, a, a lot of us are saying that justice hasn't been done, but there's been accountability you know, in uh, in this instance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, your comment about um, the the, the tech, technology and the sort of global broadcasting of this heinous act, this brutal killing, having impact. I mean, you you're an historian. You you've seen the postcards of lynchings that mm -hmm. were circulated, uh, 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 which are awful to look at. Uh, and, you know, so it's not the first time white people have seen uh, what white people have done to black folk. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're, you're apparently uh, seeing uh, something different about this particular instance. In the yeah, I think it is because, you know, what happened with the postcards of lynchings 
you know, those were celebratory and those, they tended to circulate on people who would find them, mm -hmm. you know, as causes for celebration. Uh, you know, there's a historian, Amy Wood, who wrote a really brilliant book called Lynching and Spectacle, uh, where she said the closest genre associated with the lynching image is the hunting photo. You know, how people would uh, go out and, and shoot a buck and then take a picture or they'd go out and you know, catch a large fish and take a picture standing next to the, the dead fish. Uh, and so they did the same sort of posture in lynching. But that circulated within a particular kind of crowd, within a particular moment. And the comforting mythology of, of contemporary American life is that we have aged out of those sorts of behaviors uh, and that we are past a moment where uh, that kind of overt discrimination reigns. Mm -hmm. And it's thought, you know, thought of as cynical for people to say otherwise. You know, we had this African-American president. Uh, we now have a, a Black and Asian female vice president, you know, et cetera. Uh, so the video really, I think, was the indisputable evidence of the exact moment that we live in. And because, you know, in the 1930s, 1920s, when, you know, the lynching photographs circulated, I don't think people would have professed anything else. They would have, as a matter of fact, been proud to say uh, that they did these things to Black people to maintain social subordination. Now, where we see the kind of denial that any such thing like that happens, the video was a slap in the face. It was a kind of cold dash, of, a dash of cold water. You mentioned uh, having a black president and then a, a black and Asian vice president. Uh, what, let's talk about the political impact of, of the killing of George Floyd. What do you see uh, the ramifications for politics uh, the, in this divided house that we're occupying now and that we inhabit in America, uh, mm -hmm. Republican, Democrat? What's, what's the political fallout from this uh, conviction? I think that uh, we have seen the lines clarified in particular ways. You know, for one, the implications of that video were present in November uh, with the outcome of the election. Uh, that astounding surge of outrage uh, that was viewed as an outgrowth of the kind of callousness of the previous presidential administration, uh, as well as, you know, just the kind of zeitgeist and uh, you know, power that was present with all those people pouring into the streets and wanting to find something to do. Uh, and, you know, people saying time and time again, vote. Uh, and so we don't know, it's probably uh, undeterminable about uh, how that translated from, you know, people being angry or people being outraged by the video uh, and the uptick in voter participation, but it's somewhere in there as a factor. And so that's part of it. Uh, and I also think that the, uh, the verdict, um, you know, brought this moment where we can no longer really say, uh, oh, well, police officers don't ever do anything lawless or, you know, that these concerns from these communities uh, are overblown. Uh, you know, 12 reasonable human beings thought that Derek Chauvin should be convicted on all three of the charges that were brought against him. Uh, and so I think that does have political implications, certainly also has implications uh, for district attorneys and attorney generals around the country. Uh, where people are looking at uh, the involvement of Keith Ellison um, in the prosecution of Derek Chauvin. Uh, and I think that that will likely bring pressure to other people uh, in other instances of which there are many so we see around the country, you know, the, the ongoing conflict about what happened in Elizabeth City, uh, New Jersey, what happened in Ohio, what happened in, you mm -hmm. know, I don't even want to start ticking off because there are all of these uh, instances that have emerged uh, in kind of recent moments. Uh, and you, people will look and say, like, you know, are you going to pursue these cases aggressively? Uh, are you going to uh, arm twist police into taking the stand and saying whether this person was right or wrong. Uh, the other, another thing in New York, uh, 80,000 uh, NYPD disciplinary records have been released to the public uh, that you know, had previously been shielded. Uh, the uh, immunity, uh, you know, qualified immunity that uh, may or may not go as a result of 
you know, what happens with the congressional wrangling uh, over the George Floyd justice and policing bill. Uh, all of these things, I think we can't really tell uh, what the ultimate implications of this will be politically right now. That it's going in so many different directions. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had Eddie Gloud as a speaker in the Westminster Town Hall Forum uh, last fall, and uh, we were talking about James Baldwin uh, and his work there, uh, remembering Baldwin. Uh, and he, he quoted Baldwin about, on the matter of hope, being a black man in, in America. Uh, of course, this was some time ago, but I want to ask you, as a black man in America, a person who studied these uh, issues, policing the police, uh, it, Baldwin said that he, he had a hope that is not hopeless, but unhopeful. Mm. Uh, not hopeless, but unhopeful. Mm -hmm. A kind of realistic assessment of uh, America. Uh, now, this is many decades later, but does that quote speak to you? Are, or what's, what's your sense of hope now, post uh, conviction of Derek Chauvin? I think that's about right. Um, hmm. And, you know, for me personally, I've often said, because I get the question about hope or optimism frequently, and, you know, my standard answer is that I have the optimism of a boxer in the late rounds. And, hmm. you know, what I mean by that is that you are, are confident in your ability to absorb punishment and pain in pursuit of a goal, uh, that you can get to the final bell, that if you've gotten this far, uh, you can stay on your feet and maybe even win. Uh, but you don't have any illusions about how easy things will be. Uh, you don't have, you're not naive about the fact that you'll encounter setbacks or that you will kind of walk into things that will hurt. <laughs> and uh, even as you kind of move forward with that faith, it is not an unqualified uh, belief that things will ultimately work out in your favor. It's just a kind of sense that you have the wind at your back. And by wind, I mean, you have the momentum of generations of people before you uh, who've waged this fight in an attempt to create a more democratic society. Thank you, Jelani Cobb. You've been listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, and we're grateful for your insight and for your continued work in, in journalism and history, and uh, we're looking forward to the, the change that you're helping create in our nation. Much needed. Thank you so much, Jelani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this Westminster Town Hall Forum. We have three more talks in this special series, The Arc Toward Justice, Taking Stock One Year After George Floyd's Death. Next, we'll hear from the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, Senior Minister at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. Then from Deborah Archer, the new president of the National American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, will join us. And finally, we'll meet and hear from two members of George Floyd's family, Angela Harrelson, his aunt, and Paris Stevens, his cousin. Find out more about each of these programs on our website, westminsterforum.org. Once again, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor for this series, the Minneapolis Foundation. Thanks as well to the Polad Family Foundation for supporting production of these talks. And thanks to our media partners, Minnesota Public Radio, for recording and broadcasting these talks, as well as the Min Post and Sahan Journal. Thank you, our listeners and supporters, and please join us again at the Westminster Town Hall Forum.